<laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We're going to get started. Can you guys hear me? Kind of? Louder? Like that? Yes? Hello? Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Um, my name is Olivia uh, Tinkani, and I am the program curator for IAC and Swigla's Meet to Market program. And you are here at Processor Relationships and Communication. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction about our program, and then we'll hop right into it. So, um, Meet to Market is a pretty fruitful and dynamic partnership between the Intertribal Agriculture Council and an organization based in Santa Fe called the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance, or SWIGLA. <clears throat> So Meet to Market is an extensive online business learning course for native livestock producers all across Indian country. And our goal is to encourage you all about the possibility of direct marketing your meat and providing you the skills to do so. Uh, Swigla, for those of you who don't know, I'm assuming you all know a little bit about IISC at this point, but Swigla is a nonprofit alliance of ranchers, consumers, chefs, and land managers who work together to support local grass-fed livestock products in the Southwest through producer support and education and consumer and chef outreach. So Meet to Market <clears throat> last, launched last year at this conference with a couple of in-person workshops and really excited to have more here. We've got four total between today and tomorrow. They all are listed in the program as Meet to Market. And the rest of our courses take place online. So we're rounding out our full syllabus um, of about 30 different courses. They touch on everything on the back end of the business. Uh, we host them about twice a month and they are taught by almost 150 native and non-native educators and producers. So I encourage you all to check them out. And the easiest way for you to do that is to actually take one of these flyers up here. It's got a QR code on it and you can sign up at the IAC website under resources is the meet to market page or you can just scan that cute little code. Sign up for email newsletter announcements about upcoming courses. We're on a little bit of a hiatus until February and then we'll kick back in with the last of our courses. So we have been recording all of them and they are all available for free online at the Mighty Networks platform, also available through IAC's website. Um, the courses are completely a la carte, right? So you can pick and choose what you want from the topics and dip right in wherever you see you need some skill building. If you would like to receive this presentation as a follow-up, <clears throat> please sign up at uh, up here. I've got a little thing taped to that zone over there and uh, you'll be put automatically on the database to receive information and I will also make sure to send you our presentation. A couple of more announcements. We have an amazing opportunity next year for those of you who are from the Southwest. We have, oh, there's a flyer up here about it as well. We have free one-on-one -on -one business advising for native producers living in the Southwest. This is sponsored by Swigla. And it's up to 10 hours of business advising for free to you with me over the course of the year individualized assistance on anything related to your business having to do with getting your meat to market that's it's true for those of you who are livestock producers who are thinking about it. So you don't have to be already selling meat at all. It can be something you're just even dabbling with. Um, for this round, we're offering as far as Eastern Texas, that we consider that part of the Southwest as well. So if you're interested, go ahead and sign up up there. And lastly, and similarly, I am also doing some speed consulting here at the conference tomorrow afternoon. I'm gonna be hanging out right here at the IAC booth, which I guess is right there. And you can come and talk to me about whatever you want related to your livestock and meat business for a half hour, and we can get a lot done in a half hour, I promise. Um, and that'll be between two and five tomorrow afternoon, but just go ahead and sign up. It's a different sign up sheet. Tell me if you're interested, give me your phone number, and I'll text you and we'll find a time. So that is all of my announcements. Um, again, my name is Olivia. I'm an independent teacher and educator. I teach business skills to farmers and ranchers. And that's how I got this gig. And I'm going <laughs> to, before we get into our presentation, I'm going to have our my, my co-conspirators introduce themselves too. Tell us a little bit about who you guys are. 
Thank you. I'm Chris Roper. I work with Flower Hill Institute. Uh, we are doing meat and poultry processing technical assistance. Uh, we do this for free. We're paid uh, by USDA to provide services to you all. So if you have any uh, technical assistance uh, needs or questions about meat and poultry processing, we have a very robust group of technical assistance providers, and I'll introduce some of them here in just a little bit. Some A lot of them in the room now, but uh, if, uh, we're, we're here to help you all and serve you all. Good morning. My name's uh, Trent Cassie. I'm the Director of Ag and Natural Resources for the Muskogee Creek Nation, which is located in eastern Oklahoma. I can't, is he telling me to stand up or? No. Oh, I don't know. Stand up? Okay. Yeah, I'm short. <laughs> uh, my name is Trent Cassie. I'm the Director of Ag and Natural Resources for the Muskogee Creek Nation, uh, which is located in eastern Oklahoma. I'm a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe. Um, and part of the reason I'm here is because at the nation we have a beef cattle ranch and then we have a uh, 25,000 square foot USCA inspected uh, meat processing facility and retail space. Uh, we've been open two years, so um, all this is relatively fresh on my mind. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm not really affiliated with anybody official, but um, happy to help, happy to have you guys come down and visit, do a tour, uh, answer questions or whatever we can do to um, help get your businesses off the ground. Sweet, thanks. All right, Chris, you wanna come up here too? starting oh and lastly we have some handouts here um they should be on all the chairs and we have some extras up up at the front so i'll send that out as well so if you didn't get a handout put your name on the list and i'll send it to you um just some useful information this is who we are and we're going to start with just a quick recap on regulations because we find in creating this curriculum that everybody is confused about this consistently. So we're going to revisit it. Thank you. Glad everyone came. I appreciate having a full room. We asked for a smaller room so it would look full when, when everyone got in here. So that obviously worked. So um, how many of you are meat processors? Any meat processors in the room? There you go. How many want to be meat processors? Okay, that's a lot. How many of you are processing your animals in a processing plant, maybe through a, a branded meat program, you're selling meat? Is anyone doing that? Okay, I've got a few of those too. Okay. So some of the things we're going to cover, we want to make sure that uh, we're answering your questions. Uh, I mentioned earlier about our technical assistance team. I want to introduce a few more that are in the room. In case Trent and I don't answer all your questions, there are more people in the room. Dave Carter in the, in the white straw hat. Dave works with us at Flower Hill. Uh, Rob Maddock, he's with the American Meat Science Association. He, he's out of uh, North Dakota. Dave's out of Colorado as well. Um, Abby Davidson with American Meat Processor Association. She's in Wyoming. Uh, Rebecca Thistlewaite, she's in Oregon from Oregon State University at Nish Meat Processor Assistance Network. We're all doing technical assistance through USDA's technical assistance uh, program for meat and poultry processing expansion. So we're all here to help you. If you have questions about anything to do with the meat processing regulations from development, grants, you can ask any one of us, okay? So we wanna make sure and cover that. Starting out, when we're out traveling or visiting with folks on what they wanna do or they come to us, sometimes they don't know what they wanna do. Some of our some of our initial questions we're trying to figure out are, what are you trying to do with your product? Some people have animals, they want to sell it. Some people want to have a butcher shop where they want to bring in product from uh, an inspected facility, cut it into retail packs, uh, and sell it through a butcher shop. Some want to do food boxes. Uh, you know, if you're with a tribal nation, some of the tribes are just looking to feed their people. Maybe they want to do some small processing, uh, you know, harvest those animals and just distribute that food to their tribe members. We see a lot of different things. So we want you to understand the different types of inspection that are out there that can help you and work in your favor. So I'll start off with custom inspection. This product is not typically intended for sale. So if you take an animal to a processor yourself and you're just gonna use that meat for your own consumption, that would be what custom processing and custom inspection would fall under. 
State inspection, there's only 29 states that have state inspection programs. So if you're not sure if your state has a state inspection program, we can look online, you can reach out, we'll help you find that information. But some states, 29 of them, have state inspection programs where you can have your animal processed under state inspection. You can sell it anywhere in the state. Or you can sell that online as well as long as the sale happened in the state and it's not resold in another state, okay? Key regulation there. CIS is a cooperative interstate shipment program. That is handled through your state inspector. They have a, the state inspection group has an agreement with FSIS, USDA, FSIS, where they can work with your plant and you can ship that meat anywhere in the United States. So that's through the CIS program. But that is only available through certain states. A TA program, we have some tribal facilities that are uh, Talmadge Aiken. Uh, Osage is one of them and Cherokee is another. Those are both TA plants, so Talmadge Aiken is an act that, that went into effect where states can have the inspector, and in Oklahoma they have a state inspection program, so states can have an inspector in the facility and they will do that under a federal FSIS number. So they're working together between the state and FSIS to handle that inspection uh, task. But you will deal with the state inspector. Retail exempt. I mentioned that one earlier because we see that a lot. We have a lot of people that don't necessarily want to slaughter an animal, and they might have access to a slaughter facility. So if you want to have a retail shop or a butcher shop, you can bring product in from an inspected facility an FSIS inspected facility uh, and break that product down just like a grocery store would. So we're seeing a lot of requests for that retail exempt type of facility where they don't want to do slaughter. The USDA FSIS inspection, that's kind of like the grandest of all inspection and that's what you all hear a lot of. That one covers just about everything and that, that one, you can ship the meat anywhere in the United States, and it can be sold in different states. You can sell it online. So as you're thinking about meat processing, or even if you're a branded meat program, you need to know where your product's going to end up. So if you're processing it in your state but want to sell it in another state, you cannot just have state inspection, okay? So... Whatever your program is, make sure and reach out. We can help you to understand what you need, what you need to have to do the business you want to do, and uh, we'll, we'll talk you through that process. But we wanted to make sure everyone understood that there are different types of inspection levels. There's not just one type. And you know, if we see tribal parity in the farm bill, that'll add a whole nother level to, to the mix. So uh, if tribal parity happens and tribes get an inspection authority, we'll have to have a whole nother conversation next year. So we'll, we'll, we'll tackle that when that comes. But just, it, and yeah, the great point. Plants can do more than one of these inspection types. So you can have a plant that does USDA FSIS inspection maybe one day a week. Or maybe they do FSIS inspection in the morning, and maybe they do custom inspection in the afternoon. You can do multiple types of inspection under one roof, and a lot of plants do that. Maybe Trent can talk. You're probably doing that at your plant, yeah. So we'll let Trent talk about that a little more when we get to him. But just know there, you have a lot of options when it comes to inspection, okay? Any questions on that real quick? Yes, sir, Porter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. You can do that under state inspection as well. But if he's going to be federally certified, I'm, I'm going to assume he means FSIS inspected. But in Oklahoma, where you live, you can do that under state inspection or FSIS inspection. And yeah, you can sell your branded product from your ranch. Do I have, do I need a 
you want to you want to look at the legalities. You, that that's where you want to look at your risk. You want to analyze the risk of that product. Worst case scenario, if you sell a product and somebody gets sick and they try to sue you, you're going to want some legal protections. And that's where I recommend that you all talk to a legal advisor on how you establish your entity, whether you're set up as a corporation, LLC, build in some layers of protection for your businesses, just like you would any other business. You need to protect your assets on any business that you have, but especially on a food business. Food businesses can be a little different risk level than a lot of other businesses. So theoretically, if somebody were to get sick, they would come after you and you want to protect yourself. Okay. Yes, sir. Chris, you may want to mention about the state inspection um, that the limit to within the state was for amenable species. That, that non amenable species meat that the state inspection can go outside. Yeah, yeah. Not, Dave mentioned non amenable species can, and in certain states like Oklahoma, Oklahoma will inspect your bison for free where USDA FSIS charges you an hourly rate nationwide because it's voluntary inspection. So under voluntary inspection, USDA FSIS is charging you to inspect that product. Where certain states allow them and call them amenable species. So you really wanna look at that and let us help you through that process depending on what state you're in. But under state inspection uh, on bison, you can ship that across state lines. Anything else real quick? We want to show you some examples of cut sheets. We're talking about processor relations, okay? And we're, we're, our intent is, especially for your branded meat programs, when you're, when you're marketing your products, we really need you to know what your processor limitations are. And processors as they grow, and Trent will add in here as we go, but all processors have limitations. And we're gonna show you a couple different cut sheets. Processors cannot be all things to all people. We can't do everything that you dream up. Uh, we're limited by staff, limited by equipment, packaging, labeling. So understanding what the processors can do and what they offer. Um, you know, the first cut sheet I showed was pretty detailed. It's got a lot of different cuts on there. And when you have a lot of different cuts, your animal may only have a small amount of certain cuts. So if you're gonna go out and market hanger steaks, you're only getting a couple of those per animal. If you're gonna be, if you, get, if you sell that to somebody and they really love it and you turn around and you're out of it all the time, that's not gonna help your business, okay? So we want you to understand how you market, how you work with your processor, what cuts you're offering from a processor or from a, from a producer's perspective, what products you're gonna sell. We want you to help think about all that, but these are conversations you need to be having with your processor. Trent, you wanna to add to that? Sure. Um, yeah, like Chris said, um, simple, simple is gonna be significantly better, especially when you're first starting out. I th and you'll find a lot of times people don't know what they want. Um, when they bring an animal in, it could be their first time, could be their hundredth time they will more or less take a cookie cutter cut sheet if you'll let them. But if you sit with them and go through every option and offer them a thousand options, they'll take them. Um, and they may not eat them. And, and you know, there's a lot that goes into that. Where, what are they going to do with the beef? Um, one thing that we've done, we've gotten simpler and simpler as time has gone on instead of more complicated. We, we do offer more things. Like if a customer specifically asks for something, we'll work with them, especially if they're bringing us more than one. Um, and where you're going to get into issues, like with your bottom line, if you're a custom processor, um, if a guy's bringing one a year and he's wanting a hundred different specific cuts, it's, it's a lot harder to stomach that because your bottom line, your bottom line is going like this, the longer you spend on every beef. Now, if a customer is going to bring us, you know, 10 a month or 20 a month, we're going to have a lot more flexibility in what we do with them because it's a repetition thing, right? So our cutters understand, okay, we're doing, you know, XYZ ranch beef today. They want all these cut a certain way and it's no problem to do that. Um, the simpler you can make your cut sheet, if it can translate back to the cut floor, that's going to help you a lot because you're, you're trying to cut down the risk of making errors. So if you have a cut sheet that faces the customers, it's all colorized, it looks real pretty, they have all these options on it, and then you're having to take that either back to the cut floor where people who are processing meat all day and don't care about the frills are trying to work with that, or if you do what we've seen folks do in the past, they'll have a separate 
step in the process where they'll take the cut sheet that faces the customer, break it down to another cut sheet that the butchers use, and it never fails. You're going to mess something up on that. Uh, it, I mean, it never fails. I don't care how good you are, how detail oriented you are. If you're doing a handful of these, you're going to leave something off. So um, I always recommend get as simple as you possibly can. Um, we have a couple of templates that we offer customers, especially if it's just them processing a beef for them and their family. Um, we'll offer them two or three and say, if there's something on here you're curious about, let us know. Typically they pick a standard cut sheet and it's real easy for the guys in the back to follow that. Um, but if you're, you know, we talk, we're talking about relationships. If you have someone who's bringing you several beef and you want to walk through that a little slower with them, help them to understand the intricacies and the nuance. You know, if somebody's expecting 500 pounds of beef from an 800 pound steer, you want to have that conversation up front and let them know that's not going to happen because that they will come back and gripe. I can assure you that. Um, so as transparent as you can work through the process with them as much as you can. Um, but just be honest with them. Hey, if we, if we're going to have to break this thing down into quarter inch boneless cuts, that's going to be a problem. Uh, package, you know, package size always offer something. Cause there are people that'll come in and say, well, I want all my ribeyes in one package. And then they call back and say, I've only got one package of ribeyes. Well, you, you wanted them all in one package and now you have to break them down. So, um, this is something you want to spend a lot of time on. There's templates out there online. I'm sure Chris and his folks all will offer templates. I'd offer you a template, but you need to spend some time working through this because it's the first touch point you're going to have with that customer in a lot of instances. And if there's ever an issue, it's the one you're going to go back to and kind of help explain what happened. So um, as time's gone on, we've been open two years. We've gotten simpler and simpler in our cut sheets and it's helped really streamline stuff. Customers are happy. Um, again, if there's something special they want, you can always offer that if they if they bring it up, but nine times out of ten they don't want anything special. But they're going to say yes if you're like, well, do you want do you want you know the Denver portion of this? Do you want? They're like, oh, sure, yeah, I want all of it. Well, they may probably don't want that, but they're going to take it if you offer it to them. Trent brought up some good points. If if you're if you're a if you're a rancher and you take ten head in there, and you have all ten head cut the same way, that's fairly simple. Simple enough, you can market the product easily and they can cut it easily. You're gonna save money and save headaches and errors all through the process. So think of it even from a final inventory standpoint where you're tracking that inventory. If you have 20 different, call them SKUs or product cuts that you're tracking and you're tracking an inventory for, that's gonna be much easier for you to market, track inventory, and ask for new cuts when you need those. If you take 10 animals in and have them cut 10 different ways, you have a much higher risk of errors in the plant, and you're going to have much higher risk of errors in selling your product, tracking your product, and keeping it in stock. So think about all these things, and we're going to get into labeling next, so I'll bring Trent back up on that. But all these things that we're talking about are going to lead you back into what your labels look like. And always think, you know, the labor issues that we're facing all over the nation, even at the hotel this week, we, we see labor issues all over, but we face those in the plants. We, you know, the, the, the workers that we're able to get, we're training those as fast as we can. We're building more workforce development programs as fast as we can. But, you know, even one of our discussions on Monday at one of our meetings, you know, we build the workforce development programs and we have trouble getting people to, to sign up and fill them. So labor is a constant issue. So for both of us, all of us, let's try to keep things as simple as possible and as easy to manage as possible. We're going we're gonna to keep everybody's blood pressure level a lot lower if uh, we can minimize mistakes and keep it fairly simple. We're keep it all streamlined as possible. Next, we're going to go into labeling claims. When I, when I talked to Trent last week, we were kind of prepping for this, and that was one of the first things he, he talked about is when we're talking about these early conversations and when you're even thinking about going to a processing plant, one, you have to think about your products, what you're cutting, what's your label look like. Those of you that have branded meat programs, do you have your own custom label design? There we go. Yeah, that's, that's becoming more and more popular. Even when I was at Quapaw, we started that one in 2016. We started out trying to brand that under our own name, and not very many people wanted that tribal brand. But when we started offering their brand and putting their brand on it, it blew up. And that was really the kind of the bread and butter of that operation where we, we ultimately grew to several hundred branded meat programs for your ranch your ranch, your product, 
but it becomes your label. And those label concerns, we not only have to look, think about the graphics and what that graphics looks like, but we have to look at all the different cuts that you have chosen now, how those get packaged, how they're labeled, how big the label has to be, how big the packaging bag is, how all that fits. We have to plan all this out really months in advance. So before you ever really make this cut sheet with Trent or your processor, we have to design the label, print the label, have it at the plant so that you can get your product package right when you deliver it, right? So when you deliver an animal to the plant, you only have about 10 days, two weeks-ish to, to get all this done and back out to you so you can sell it. We cannot get labels approved, especially if you have special claims. So if you have special claims that have to be done, we have to plan months in advance. So when you're thinking about branded meat programs and labeling and special packaging, I'm going to let Trent go into that deeper. But we have to think about this months in advance of you processing your meat. Will you also tell us what special claims are, Trent? Um, sure. So a lot of a lot of producers, um, maybe you want to market your product as organic or grass fed. Um, any any type of claim, and there's a there's a ton of regulations out there. Um, you cross over from USDA to FDA when you're starting to talk about label claims. So, uh, for example, if I say, all right, I'm going to sell um, grass finished or grass fed grain finished, I'm going to sell certified organic or non-GMO or any any way that you kind of see folks trying to distinguish their product and typically for a premium, um, that's going to be called a special claim. And there's guidance out there on the FDA website. Um, now, you know, we talk about USDA, we're all talking about USDA in the meat processing world, but when you get to label claims, you have to go through the FDA and there's affidavits that you have to sign. Um, most processors, so put my processor hat back on real quick, most processors offer a service to where they will, for a fee, work that process through for you, but you are going to have to certify information with your veterinarian. Uh, for example, if you say uh, hormone-free or raised without growth hormones, you're going to have to go to your veterinarian. They're going to have to fill out some paperwork. And it's, it's, it's legal affidavits you're ha having to sign saying that you're following this production method. You can't just, like Chris said, and this happens, you cannot just drop your beef off and then call me in two weeks and be like, by the way, I need all that labeled hormone free. That is not going to happen. Uh, it can't, it can't happen. There is process you have to go through with the FDA to get those claims put on there. Um, certify, you know, cho people want to say, well, I want that to say prime. Well, prime is a USDA grade. And unless your plant has a grader, not an inspector pays for a grader, they cannot put prime on your beef. They can't put prime rib roast. Even if you think it's a prime rib roast and you want to tell everybody it's prime premium, super high quality beef, you can say, premium, you can say these other things, you cannot say prime, you cannot say choice. Um, that also ties into with what Chris was saying about the labeling and the types of graphics and things that you're able to put on a label. Um, every label, if you're selling, if you're dealing with the public, has to have certain things on, on it. It has to have a safe food handling, which is going to take up about yay much of any label that you put on there, no matter what you want. And I, you can kick and scream all you want. I cannot take that off there. It has to have your bug. So if it's federally inspected, um, it's got a little circle. It's got an establishment number on there. It says inspected and passed by USDA. That has to be on there, whether whether the producer likes it or not. But the best time to tell a producer that is up front. Hey, we're going to have three-fourths of this label are taken with stuff that I have to put on there. Now, we can change the color, potentially, if you have the right kind of labeler, um, which, again, make sure you have the right kind of labeler before you tell someone you can put a full-color 3D graphic on a label because you probably can't. Um, and then weight claims is another thing that Chris and I talked about. If you're running it, for example, through a roll stock machine and you're saying, okay, we're going to do uh, 36 ribeyes off this beef, for example, we're going to say they're a pound. Well, you have to make sure you can either cut to spec. So you have 10 ounce or 12 ounce or 14 ounce ribeyes if that's what the label has, because there's only a certain amount of variance and it's only up that you can do that. So you can put a pound if it's 1.1 ounce, but you can't put a pound if it's 15 ounces. Um, and you're going to, you're going to run into that where customers want all 10 ounce ribeyes bone in. Well, it's going to be difficult to do that very thick. So, um, understanding your capabilities and your limitations, like Chris said, um, whether that's with equipment. So do you have a bandsaw you can run stuff through that's going to be able to scale that upright? Uh, can you even get an eight ounce bone in ribeye that's three quarters inch thick? You cannot do that but they'll want that. So you have to be able to have those conversations with them and putting any of those claims on the label. Um, you're going to have to go through the FDA if they're special claims, and then you're uh, going to have to make sure that your labeler can do what it is that you're saying 
you can do. So in our in our plant, we have three different labeling systems. We have one that goes on the roll stock. So for pre-cut stuff, rolling it through there, can slap it on there. It's a heat uh, based prints right on the label. But it only prints on a standard label and only a standard certain amount. So you can't promise the sky, you know, rainbow colored labels with everything on there if your printer can't do it. And a lot of times you have to pre-order these labels for these customers, again, months in advance. Um, the problem with that is you are going to be stuck holding the stock of those labels for a long time. So these are conversations you need to have ahead of time. How many are you planning on doing? If I have to order a pallet to get this pricing, this is what it's going to cost. This is the limitations of the label, etc. Then we have a scaled labeler, which is just if we put our product on it, it kicks out the weight and the price. Um, it's a lot more complicated than you think to go in and add a skew. Chris talked about a skew. So every product you sell or could potentially sell, you have to pre-enter that skew on there and it puts it in there in the system and make sure that it prints it out correctly. Uh, you're going to have problems with your labeler. You're going to have problems with your labeler. So get to know the service folks on those really well because the worst time to have a problem is when you've got product on the floor being cut and slammed to you and you've got racks and racks and racks of beef or whatever to package and you have no way to label it. Um, if it's federally inspected, you have to label it under inspection and you can't just say, oh, we'll get to that tomorrow. It'll mess up your whole production week. So those are things to take into account ahead of time. Always have backup labelers, always have those service guys numbers ahead of time. And if you're dealing directly with a customer from a processor's perspective, have those conversations early because like Chris said, they drop a beef off, call you in nine days. By the way, that's supposed to be this pretty logo that I've got and I needed to say all grass fed or organic. That's not going to happen. <clears throat> Thanks, y'all. Um, so we're going to shift gears a little bit, but the, you know, the reason that we dove into some of the more nuts and bolts here is because the point of this conversation today is actually to inspire good relationships and good communication. So we wanted to touch on some of the major issues about regulations and things like labeling that, that, that these guys really think are the most important to start with. And we're going to go um, a little deeper into the soft skills, right? So I think the first thing that I like to start with is just remembering that this is a partnership, right? This is not a vendor relationship. This is a partnership between you and your processor. Um, you're also dealing in a dying industry. Maybe you think yours is a dying industry as a rancher. So is theirs. And they are fundamental for your survival. You've got however many months or years, more likely years, into that animal. And you have one person who's in charge of getting it successfully to market, which is your processor and their team. Um, so just understand the interdependence between the two of you. And the relationship directly impacts what you get back, right? This is the only part in your supply chain where you give up complete control as a producer. And so that's scary, right? I get it. And so we can get a little bit touchy about that. And it inspires sometimes adversarial behavior. And we're here to encourage you not to have that attitude. There's really no room for it, right? Again, this is a partnership. Some could say that this is the most important partnership that you have. Um, and what we see is that most of the frustration comes from a lack of understanding or some miscommunication. So we want to just review some things today in hopes that you find that understanding. Um, so I'm not going to read all these, but some common external issues that, that both Trent and Chris have already touched on here. Um, just a list of things that cost plant money right? Uh, we're here to talk about the different ways that y'all can work together. And my favorite way for people to work together is to have empathy. And that means understanding what the other person is going through, right? So these are, look at all of these things that cost the plant extra money. And then what are some things that we can do to help them out, right? Sorting out injured animals, getting there on time, organizing pickups, reducing customized requests, like Trent mentioned, co-investing in equipment and software. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Asking questions. Um, so here's my empathy slide. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have a t-shirt that says practice radical empathy that I like to wear when I do this presentation just to inspire all of you all. Um, we're talking about understanding what the processor's needs are. We know you understand what you need. We need you to understand what they need also. So what is their daily reality like? What is their business model? What is their throughput? 
right? What is their labor situation? And again, what costs them money? And and MPAN, the Niche Meat Processors Assistant Network, has a great little handout that's about small plant economics. Um, it's designed, I think, Rebecca, maybe you can tell us, it's designed for a processor or somebody who's thinking about processing, but I like to give it out to producers to tell them, like, look, look, look at what's going on in the back of the room back there. Um, and the most important and, and interesting way to inspire empathy, I think, is, is what we like to call appreciative inquiry, asking questions and then listening well to the answers. Ask questions that make things clear. Again, we're not just thinking about what you need, we're thinking about what they need to. Um, so Trent, what do you wish more producers knew about the plant and how it operates? Um, that's, that's a, that's a good question. There, there's a lot specifically. I wish our people knew our plant was open to the public because, uh, they don't know that a lot. Um, all of these details though are, are important. Everything from the labeling to the type of packaging and the cost that's associated with that packaging, um, hang time, um, shrink, shrink's a big one. Carcass weight's a big one. Uh, we get a lot of folks that grandpa, granddad's always fed steers for 30 days on, and they're 900 pounds and they bring them in and then they go in the retail space and want to know why I've got 15 and a half inch ribeyes that are highly marbled and theirs are not. Um, and when you have that retail space, um, you know, facing the public, they're going to see kind of the product you're putting out. Um, a lot of times folks will come in and we've got beeves from the ranch that are 1500 pounds, finished on the hoof and then they come drop their 900 pounder off and then that's a good point a good time to have that conversation with them you know what are your expectations with this meat um are you telling folks that it's going to be super high marbled and super tender and that calf may only be you know 12 months old uh your ribeyes are going to your ribeyes are going to be smaller or they're not going to quite marble well because they haven't had the time on feed a lot of that is tied to genetics of course which are difficult to change and take a lot of time to change and frankly people don't want to hear it that maybe their beef don't have the genetics to marble prime but that's the facts um it's a lot easier to have that conversation when they drop the animal off than it is to have that conversation when they're staring at a package and they're hacked off because it looks like a deer. Um, and that is going to happen. Um, the size of it also, I mean, it's funny, but you, people are, they're going to be fired up whenever they're looking at a prime ribeye that you raised and then they're looking at theirs. They're like, this is, why aren't you doing this to mine? I'm like, well, I can't do that to yours. I'm happy to sell you some of mine. But, um, you know, the cost associated with that, when folks come in and ask about, well, I fed this steer for, you know, 30 days, what should I price it at? I'm like, well, I'm feeding, my, it costs me almost $700 to feed a steer out right now uh, with grain prices. That's 155, 165 days on feed. They're like, well, oh, that I don't want to feed them that long. I'm like, well, I don't want to feed them that long, but that's what you got to do to get them to that prime level. Um, so these conversations are, are ones that maybe on the processor side, you wouldn't necessarily think you have to have when you go back to talk about how folks are doing it out in the country on the ground. Um, how are they getting that beef to have that, you know, that final product? Um, she mentioned a lot of, uh, you know, empathy and work and having a symbiotic relationship. And if you want to do it long-term with that customer, um, that, that means a lot being able to have that conversation with them. Like, look, you know, this is what you're trying to do. Um, this is how we do it. It's not the way you have to do it necessarily. Maybe you have some other producer contacts you can point them to that do raise beef that way. Um, the earlier you can have those conversations, the better before you've got a deer hanging in your cooler that they're going to wonder why it didn't grade prime. And that's going to happen. People are, people don't understand the time that it takes, the genetics that it takes. And they may, they may feed one for 200 days and it still won't marble and it have fat on it that big and they drop it off. They're like, man, look at that look at the fat cover on that thing. It's going to be great. And by the time you trim all that off, they lose all that. And so having those conversations with producers early on, um, establishing that relationship is very important. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <clears throat> he, he spurred my memory on a few different things and not always good memories, but how many of you feed or, or, or slaughter cull cows? What we call cull cows? Heifers, bulls, finished steers. They're all different, right? Bison, they're all different. Yields are different. Cuts have to be different. We have to treat the animal different. Even grass-fed. Some of you do grass-fed, and some of you have markets for grass-fed. They don't have the same yields as the steers that Trent's talking about. So you, you have to have realistic expectations when you drop an animal off at the plant. And we really like everyone should spend more time educating yourselves on what yields you should be expecting. And, and Trent, you hear it a lot at all processors. Customers come in and go, where's my meat? Why didn't I get all my meat back? Well, there's distinct differences and it goes all the way back to the way you raise the animal, where you got the animal and your cut sheet. 
if you if you listed out all boneless cuts on your cut sheet, you're losing all of that bone weight in your overall yield. And something I recommend to all of you when you drop an animal off, get the live weight that you drop off. Not necessarily from your ranch, because it's going to lose weight the whole time you leave your ranch to the time you drop it off. Just like you're taking that animal to the sale barn. They're shrinking all the time. So get a live weight. Get a hot carcass weight. So the time they split that animal, cut the head off, gut it, pull the hide off, get the hot carcass weight. You'll have a side A and a side B. That will give you the yield from your live weight to hot carcass weight. And then take it a step further. You can also, a lot of plants can weigh that carcass again when it goes into the cutting room. A lot of plants have rail scales. When they slide that side in, you reweigh it. The longer you hang it, the less it's gonna weigh. You're losing yield. So understand that, and, and Rebecca at MPAN, they've got some great tools. Uh, David Zarling has some great informational slides and information that they share. Yields are everything, especially if you're in the meat business. When you're selling meat, you're selling pounds. If you're gonna, if you're gonna age an entire animal for 21 days and let it shrink down, you're losing yield. If you're deboning everything, you're losing yield. Understand that process and understand the yields for the different types of animals that you're processing. And just another little meat to market plug. Um, Rob, who just stepped out of the room, and I just did an hour and a half on yield <laughs> and margin. Um, and it's online and it's called Yield and Margin Pricing and Profitability. So if you head over to that Mighty Network site, you can find long long webinar on that and some pretty cool tools as well as well as some charts on industry norms and stuff um <clears throat> so back to relationships uh right how do we make a good first impression again this is this is just like a partnership here right so treating people as your equal not as a vendor right not as a servant um, and that means mostly investing time before your first drop and we're talking about getting to know each other getting on a first name basis and visiting the plant ahead of time to ask questions and have a meeting far before you're bringing an animal um, be respectful and be timely be reliable and give compliments it really helps to make people feel good right um Scheduling, I know some of you are saying, well, this is sort of fluffy, right? But I promise you that this, these soft skills are the route to get what you want out of that animal, right? Um, scheduling harvest dates ahead of time. Um, obviously, probably most of you of our, that are producers in the room have dealt with long lead times. So that's probably known. But for those of you who are just getting into this or thinking about it, most processors are booked pretty far in advance. And so try your hardest to book ahead of time, keep those dates and show up and give a bunch of notice if you have to cancel. And obviously weather happens. We know that. But just again, if we've built good trust, and a good relationship with people, then our processors are going to work with us when we have anomalous situations. Um, establish your communication style. Just because you like to talk on the phone or you like to send an email doesn't mean that that's how your processor best works. So asking ahead of time how they like to communicate. Um, what are the cutoff deadlines for different changes that you want to make, whether that's to your cut sheet or to your, or to your pickup or to your drop-off? Um, what does it look like when a direct customer comes and picks up their meat? Uh, somebody that you've sold live to that then has had custom processed at your processor, and we're going to talk about that in a minute in more depth. Uh, ask about the animal welfare situation, right? What are they doing with your animals? Um, we have in our slaughter and processing course, I think it was that one. We've got a number of processing courses already up that Meat to Market has brought to the table. And we have, in one of them, we go into more depth about animal handling um, with Dr. Denise Perry on, on the drop-off and understanding what happens in that last stage and what you want to ask your processor about. Um, logistics, we've talked a little bit about this already, but things like invoicing and payment terms, let's not leave that to the last minute to talk about. So your handout has a bunch of of these questions and many more that we have compiled over the years with 
number of different contributors adding into those that questions list. Um, and so that's a really great take home for y'all. That's, you know, you walk into that as your cheat sheet for talking to processors um, out, out of the gate. Uh, so I'm going to hit it back over to Trent again. And what do you do at the plant to ensure good communication between you and your producers? Like what are your communication systems? Um, so we, we share a primary point of contact, um, and you'll, you'll find that a lot of people want to talk to like the guy or the girl in charge. Um, the problem is a lot of times that's not the person who's doing the work in the back. Um, we, we are really fortunate. We have a, a gal named Bree who's excellent with customer communication. She's happy to answer questions. Um, she's honest enough to tell them like, Hey, we can't do that now. You know, we're already cutting your beef. Sorry. We can't make it bone, bone in now. Cause you already wanted it boneless. Um, but we have a central point of contact for, for them to reach out to. Um, and I understand people, they want to talk to me or they want to talk to Grant, who's our plant manager. Um, and we do that when we can, but all the, all of the communication flows through Brianne. She's available through phone call, email, um, or text message, you know, any, any way that they want to communicate, we're willing to meet them kind of where they're at, but it's important that if you're going to do that, especially if you're going to offer multiple ways to communicate with folks that you have a central sort of point of contact. And then she knows, um, because she's been there long enough, she's been in, she's worked in the back, she's worked up front, but she knows, okay, this information I need to take to, you know, these guys on the floor, this information, I need to make sure that folks on packaging know, or this information they changed on the labeler. We got to get that done ahead of time. Um, it, that doesn't work if they can call and talk to 10 different people. It just doesn't work. Um, as much as you would like to have maybe whoever's running your retail store, just answer the phone because they're standing there. That's great. Trust me, you're going to save yourself a million headaches if you just have them take a message and have Brianne, your Brianne, whoever that is, your Brie, call them back. Uh, because that one point of contact who's great with customers, who's patient, who understands when someone just needs to vent or if they have actual legitimate questions or concerns and who to take those to is going to be worth their weight in gold. Thanks, Trent. <clears throat> so for those of you who are producers in the room and not processors, your question is going to be, okay, who am I talking to? And it's not to just call the plant manager when the plant manager has told you to call Bree, right? And don't forget that. Do what they're asking you to do and you'll get a lot better service and a lot better results. Um, so a little bit more due diligence here on building this relationship. Um, Y'all share in record keeping practices, right? It's not just up to the processor. Um, you're going to provide clear cutting instructions based on their cut sheet. You're going to be talking about that ahead of time. We already went deep into that. But remember that also the production, the production report, a processing report, is not always standard. This is a question that you're asking ahead of time as well. What do you get when you pick up the meat? Um, be sure that you know this before that pickup so that if you want something different, you can maybe negotiate. Can you give me a report at the end? And a lot of the custom exam processors, small guys won't actually do that. So what if they don't do that? What are you doing? You're going to count your meat. You're going to weigh it. You need to know what your inventory is. You're not just going to blame the processor for not doing something that is not in their system. You still need to know what's going into the freezer or out the door, right? So keeping track is something that we also have built a nice little tool for, and I encourage you to go over to our yield and margin webinar to find that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about creative collaborations as well. So joint problem solving. Um, this is what we do in our romantic relationships, right? <laughs> uh, so this is what we should be doing with our processors as well. Um, don't, don't expect them to be whoever you think they should be right? Just as we would with a romantic partner. Get involved, right? Uh, get invested. And sometimes what this leads to is some pretty cool solutions. So I wanted to just real quickly tell some, some real life examples. And I wanted to ask you all to, um, if you have some examples to inspire all of us. So I've got one processor um, that actually hired additional, um, additional IT, right? Like, at the insistence of the producer co-op group, got an IT specialist in, they cost shared, figuring out their scale and how to get the type of production report out of it that the producer group wanted. Um, I got another distributor aggregator that actually purchased iPads for the processor to have iPads functionality on the floor, um, on, the on the cut floor for them. Um, 
Then we've got like another producer. This is a pretty large hog producer in California, large meaning like 80 hogs a week. So not super big. Um, that went, that cost shared on the bacon roll stock machine with their processor. Cause they didn't have one yet. And they said, look, we're going to, this is going to pay us back over time. Um, in terms of the product that we can sell at the higher margin because it's flat packaged on a roll stock machine and that's going to look prettier and I can add on, I can tack on money. Um, we, West Georgia Processing, we purchased Metro, that's me. We purchased, I mean, I'm not West Georgia Processing, but that's a processor that I worked with. We purchased all their Metro racks. We purchased all their labeling machines. We said, we need these things. We need to organize our inventory when we have pickup. Let's, let's get some used Metro racks in here so that we, you have a better way of storing our inventory for the few days before we can come pick it up. That's not just the this like pile of boxes, right? Um, that was also a little shop, as you can imagine. Uh, barcode inventory tracking software co co purchase. Uh, we did also one of uh, I ran restaurants and farms for a while. We did a joint seam butchery workshop with our processor. We went into a small custom exempt shop in rural Georgia with a seam butcher from Manhattan for a couple of days, and they just hung out and taught each other things. Um, we benefited directly from that relationship. We got the style of cuts that we wanted. Our processor got to learn how to push back and also how to do some new things and also how to find efficiencies. Um, so these are some examples of creative storytelling. I would love to hear from the audience if anybody has any creative collaborations they want to tell us about before I ask Trent the same question. Does anybody have any experience with things like this that they want to inspire us by? I know you all are now inspired to go out and do these creative collaborations. Trent, you got any examples of things like this? Um, yeah, we, we've done a couple of uh, things that, that um, Olivia mentioned. One was we've had vendors call and say, hey, I need this by X date. And uh, this particular vendor um, also does some work for us in our refrigeration. And they were wanting to um, do a thousand bags of beef jerky to give out to their um to give out to their staff for Christmas and they needed a custom label. Um, one of the, you know, we kind of troubleshot with them like, Hey, we can't, we can't get those labels in the stickers that you're wanting. We can't get them in on time. And so we were just honest with them. We're like, Hey, you know, we, we can do the jerky. We've got the bags, we've got everything else, but we can't get your logo onto any of our labels the way that you want it do you guys have a supplier who you work with? And they were like, absolutely. So they actually reached out and handled the label process for us. Um, it worked out really well. It saved them some money, saved us some headache, as opposed to us either missing out on a thousand bags of beef jerky um, or telling them we could do it and then spending two weeks you know, fretting because we couldn't. Um, we've had other other vendors, kind of like Olivia mentioned, say, hey, I want a certain style of, of jerky or a certain style of meat bar. Uh, maybe we don't have an extruder or maybe we don't have, um, we don't have the piece of equipment that fits on our equipment to make what they want. And they're more than happy typically to purchase that um, or at least share in the cost of that because it's not going to raise their processing costs. Because if you're just honest with them, you're like, look, I have to do, that's a $12,000 attachment to a machine that I already have that I'm buying only for you, you know? So either you're going to have to help me out and, you know, we can come up with a way to either increase your processing costs for that um, above what's advertised, or you can purchase the piece of equipment. And if you ever go somewhere else, take it with you. Um, the, typically folks are willing to work with you like that. If you're upfront with them, if you just call them and say, well, it's going to cost you $4 a pound to get that done. They're going to be like, what? why? Um, another thing is boxes. A lot of times if a customer wants like a custom box, um, they have to not only buy a certain amount ahead of time, but they also have to pay like somebody to make the die for the box. Um, they're going to want you to not charge them more for that unless you explain to them why they're wanting a custom box. They ha you have to buy a $700 die to make these boxes and they have to make 5,000 of them then they're going to understand as opposed to just saying, no, we can't do that. And then we'll all find somebody who will, cause they will find somebody who will. Um, I tell my guys all the time that we take a cow to a cell barn. Somebody always thinks they're a better cowboy than you. You can take it. You can take a calf. They're gonna be like, I can straighten that calf out. There's going to be somebody who will tell them they can do it. Uh, good for them. Please go do that. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm willing to tell them why, you know, this is why we can't do that or why if we're going to do that, it's going to, cost significantly more than what you're expecting for a dollar pound processing. Um, but kind of like Olivia pointed to earlier, those, those conversations, just being real with somebody and telling them, look, this is the economics. I'm trying to make a living. You wouldn't sell me that fat steer for $300 just because I came in and batted my eyelashes at you. So this is why I can't do that. 
you know, for you. Um, typically, if they're a business individual, they're trying to make a living as well. They understand that if you're up front with them and don't just slap them with a bill at the end or tell them, no, I can't do that. That goes a long way. Oh, and one more thing, if I can, real quick. Uh, I t- we talked about shrink. Yeah, I'm going to be real quick. We talked about shrink real quick. One of the things that's probably cut down complaints the most on us is if I have a customer who has that problem, we'll invite them onto the floor when we're getting ready to cut their animal. Perfect example, we had a guy dropped off 10 goats, um, and he was expecting to get a lot of weight back from these goats. And we were like, okay, you know, we're going to have to cut them the next day and you're only going to get X amount of, of meat from them. There's, there's no way they shrink that much. And I was like, okay, how about this? We'll cut them on Tuesday. Come, come to the plant. Um, and he was just on, he was honestly, he was just honored to be able to come in and see that process. And he learned a lot about his animals and what he was going to get back when you bring a product out on the floor. Same thing. If you age a beef, we call it the second skinning. If you age a beef for 30 days, the whole carcass, and you're gonna have to trim that whole outside off. It's a sec- it's basically skinning that animal twice. If you don't explain that to a customer, you just tell them that after you've already done it, they're going to be hacked off. If you invite them to the floor the day you're going to cut that beef up and they see what's on there and you're like, look, I can, we can cut this on the saw right now and I can package that with the black side out. If that's what you want us to do. Or we can cut all that off there. It's going to look a lot better, but you're going to lose a bunch of weight. Typically, those conversations are a lot better had when they're on the floor seeing the product, seeing what happens when they age the carcass. And I realize everybody can't just, you can't invite everybody in. I understand that. But people you're developing a relationship with that you're going to be doing this with for a long time, take the effort. It is a pain. It's not fun to cut while somebody's watching over your shoulder, but they're going to learn a ton about what happens when they get 150 pounds back versus 500 they're expecting with if they're able to be there and take part in that process. It's a great example, Trent. So for producers, right, that's you just asking to be there. Um, So real quick here, customer service. I just didn't want to leave this off. I know we're at time. But for those of you who are custom exempt processing and you're selling your animals live so that those customers can actually take back a share or an eighth or a quarter or half, um, you have a role. You still have a role in providing service. Um, so these are just some bullet points of how to go about doing that in a way that will ease your processor relationship, right? And it's really just about forewarning and, and being providing white glove service to both your end buyer who has purchased the animal and ideally and not just the cuts illegally um, and your producer, I mean, and your processor, who's your partner in this. Um, so I don't think we have time for Q and A cause we got to go right into the next session here, but um, I encourage you all to get in touch with us and in the handout is also our emails um, and you can copy them down here. Uh, I forgot to mention that Jamie was in here, <laughs> but, uh, they, yeah, we'll just leave that off. Anyway, thanks y'all for participating. Please be in touch with us. We're very uh, available to answer questions um, after the fact, and I'll be here for the next few days, and so will Chris. So thanks y'all. <laughs>